Good morning. Welcome to Salem Bible Church, September 20th. We're going to start out with Wonderful Grace of Jesus, number 338. Greater far than all my sin and shame. 
Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, preaching the most evil. Mind is transforming power, making him God's dear child. Urgency, peace, and For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountains, farther like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgression, I shake it. Greater far than all is sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. Ooh, I love that song. So I didn't know what the first song was, and I was going up to my office to get my sermon notes. It's wonderful, Grace of Jesus. Listen, when you're singing bass in any kind of a choir, normally it's. Bass is supportive, but not very exciting. But this song, whoever wrote this song was a bass all the way. And so I had to run back down here because I want to get to that greater far than all. My sin and shame, sing it. <laughs> not only is the song exciting, but we're talking about his wonderful <clears throat> grace. That means he gives us things we don't deserve. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That, my friends, is the wonderful grace of Jesus. That we ask anything in his name and he's hearing and listening. That's the wonderful grace of Jesus. And so when you sing songs like that, you have to be thinking about all the things that he's done for us. Last couple of weeks, we've been spending some time... Uh, in the book of Luke, talking about that one phrase where Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is required. This song reminds you about the much that was given. We took you back to Psalm 103 where it talked about his compassion and his love and how he separates our sin as far as the east is from the west. That's all grace. Great song to begin with. Father, thank you so much for your wonderful grace. Not only is this song fun to sing, uh, but, Lord, it is wonderful to remember your wonderful grace. Sometimes, Lord, in the busyness of life, we need moments like this where we think about all the things that you have just given to us. It's hard for me to kind of think about what it was like for Jesus to leave the splendor of heaven. I mean, our only thing to compare it to is the beauty of this earth, and yet heaven is so much more wonderful. And Jesus left that to walk on this earth to give his life on a cross for us. Lord, that's wonderful grace. And so we thank you for songs that remind us of that and for services where we can kind of stop with all the craziness that's going on in the world and think about all the things that you've done for us. The folks who can say to whom much has been given. Thank you for that, Lord. Encourage us throughout this day. Perhaps there's some folks here or online whose hearts are heavy this week. May they be encouraged by the songs and the word. We give this hour to you, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Next, we're going to sing It Took a Miracle, which is 494 in your hymnal. But there's a fourth verse, which isn't in our hymnal, so it'll be on the screens, okay? took a miracle. Oh, 
here this week. This week, Wednesday night, of course, is going to be a prayer meeting. It's going to be online only. Next Sunday night, we're going to have an after-church fellowship, obviously, after the evening service. So even if you don't normally come to the Sunday evening, we encourage you to do that when the church service is done. We're going to go outside. We're going to have some Chicago hot dogs, Wisconsin burgers, and you don't need to bring anything. We're going to bring it all, right, uh, Scott? We're going to be all set for that. Just come, bring yourself, bring a friend. Now, this is Michigan, so what does that mean? Uh, it's September. You could either wear shorts or a winter jacket. You never know what's going to happen around here, so uh, uh, just plan ahead for that, and uh, we'll make sure that uh, uh, we have some great fellowship together. Remember, we have a prayer phone that's uh, open every day from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, someone will answer that phone, pray with you, take prayer requests, so that phone number's on there. We're going to make up some new uh, flyers to put up around town and some cards that you can hand out that will have that number on it. We'll start getting that out there. But that's what's going on here. Come October, we're going to try to get back into a regular schedule. We're going to have our board meetings again on the first Monday of the month. We're going to have communion uh, the first Sunday of the month. Howard, let's make a note of that. We'll have it. Let's just keep it obvious, just morning service. I think it'll be easier for everybody. So uh, try to get back into that regular schedule. We want to get our living proof going uh, uh, the gals gave me a schedule. It looks like they're going to try to start getting kids back in class come October 12th, I think. So we'll chat about that, Scott, to see how you'd be for food-wise. Uh, uh, we're going to tweak it a little bit, our living proof, on Wednesday nights, but we want to get back to reaching into the lives of these kids. And so uh, we'll let you know what the exact date is on that. But come October, we're going to try to get things rolling just a little bit. As always, thanks to all of you for your uh, generosity and continuing to support the church during these difficult times. Let's take a moment and just thank the Lord for this building and this outreach, and then I'll bring you up to speed on some things that we need to be praying for. First, Lord, just thank you for your saints. Thank you for their generosity, and thank you, Lord, that they're continuing to give during this crisis, because it's allowed us to do things we haven't done before, to post uh, these messages online, to look for different ways uh, to reach the community around us. And so, Lord, we just thank you for them. Thank you for the privilege of giving and, of course, as a church, for the privilege of serving. So, Lord, we thank you for that. Continue to meet our needs. Lord, we don't know what the future holds. You do. And so continue to give us what we need to keep these doors open and to allow us to keep talking about you. So we thank you for these things and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, what are some things that are going on here this week? Continue to pray for Ray and Tracy. They're here with us today. They seem to be doing a little bit better. But uh, Ray is uh, still got the kidney dialysis. What else is going on, Ray? Uh, 
haven't slept in three days, just not feeling well, just... Oh, okay. All right. So obviously, not only the transplant issues, now some circulation problems in the legs. And what about you, Trace? Do you think they got the meds pretty well? No, they're still working on that. Okay. All right. So keep praying for them. Nancy Fisher was able to get that shunt put in and uh, keep praying for her. And then Leanne Rigstad. Uh, Leanne, uh, who's here today, was at work and slipped on some water and broke her kneecap. And uh, I got you down, surgery still next week, 29th? 29th. Okay, so supposed to be the 29th. If you've ever been dealing with... If you've ever been dealing with workman's comp, there is a possibility if you get injured in 2020 that they may fix it by 2022. <laughs> so uh, just pray for uh, them as uh, they try to figure that out. Leanne's the one kind of wandering around on, uh, on crutches. My guess is she'll be here working next Sunday night at the fellowship and we'll keep working until they wire her kneecap back together. So uh, pray for her on that. Obviously, so much stuff going on in our country. If you are not a regular prayer for your country, you need to be now, because there is chaos going on. We're going to talk about it a little bit in our message, but, you know, from the state of California, where they're shutting churches down, to now this argument over the Supreme Court justice, and they're threatening to riot in the streets if Trump appoints somebody. I mean, there is chaos afoot. And so we need to be praying that God will keep this country together uh, for a number of reasons why we love this country, and uh, it gives us the freedoms to talk about him. So you need to be praying for that on a regular basis. The other thing, too, is, man, we're moving into the next flu season. Uh, and I don't know about you, but this is the time of the year that I was dreading to happen because everybody is so nervous about coughs and sneezes. And I want to wear, a, I guess I might just get a T-shirt that says, listen, it's the flu. Allergy season. <laughs> my, no, I, I sneezed about 20 times before I came over today, and if I was in public, somebody beat me up and throw me in a dumpster. <laughs> what are you doing out when you're sick? It's allergies. But man, it's crazy times out there, and so uh, we need to be praying for our church, for our outreaches, and of course for those in our church family that are going through difficult times. So let's take a moment as we do and pray for some of these things. And as always, if you've got prayer requests you want us to bring up, make sure that you give it to us. Uh, we've got to try and figure out Wednesday, if we have the kids here on Wednesdays, and I'm trying to do prayer meeting, is that going to work? I don't know. Should, do we do Living Proof on Tuesdays? Because they don't have any school on Wednesdays, if you're telling me right. No school on Wednesday, just virtual school on Wednesday. So we're going to have to talk a little bit about what night we want to do Living Proof, how would that work out, and then what I do about... I might have to get here at 5 and, and tape the prayer meeting and you play it at 7, but we'll figure it out. These are all things that we have to try to... I've said this a number of times to people. There, there's no playbook for a pandemic. Uh, I went to Bible college, I went to seminary, and they didn't hand me a little book that says, listen, when COVID gets here, <laughs> this is what you do. And so we're learning together, but I thank you for, uh, for you. Lord, thank you so much also for the power of prayer and the fact that right now, everybody here and the folks that are working online, we can unite our hearts and come into your presence and ask you for help on these things. You've done so many miracles for Ray and Tracy. And Lord, you need to continue to do those. We need Tracy's medicines just to get evened out so there's no more worry about seizures. There's no more worry about any of the other side effects that she's experienced as a result of that. And so... We need her, her to be in full health. And now, Lord, we pray for Ray as he's going to be dealing with this long-term situation with his heart and worries about rejection and taking all these medicines, and now his legs are hurting him. And he has to go to dialysis several days a week. And so, Father, we know you did this miracle for a reason and that you are preparing something big for that family, a, a miracle of service for you. But we need them to be strong been praying for a long time that these kidneys would just wake up and he wouldn't have to keep going to dialysis or get on another transplant list. And so, Father, we just pray that you might intercede for him. For the folks in our church that are struggling with cancer, and Lord, sometimes the treatment 
uh, is more difficult to go through than the cancer itself. And so we pray for all those that are struggling from the after effects of the radiation. I know some of the folks, boy, they just have no appetite as a result of it. And so, Lord, we just pray that you will bring them through this time of difficulty and get them to the point where they can hear that their cancer is gone and they can get back uh, busy serving you. And then, Father, for Leanne and this upcoming surgery, we just pray that you'll kind of light a fire under workman's comp this week and so that the paperwork will flow and that the doctor that she's found will be able to uh, repair this knee and get her back to work, get her back to the fact that she is feeling good enough to just be the, the blessing she is to us and her family, her grandkids. Lord, watch over her and we leave her in your hands. And then for our church, Lord, these are... Well, they're new times for us, and we're not sure what to do. What day should we have living proof, and what should it look like, and um, how do we work prayer meeting into all of that? These are things we're not sure of, but you do. You know what's best for us, so give us the wisdom. Help us to see what would work for our kids that we have, for our church family. And so, Lord, as we move ahead, this is, this is the moment now. We need you to guide us and uh, show us. What's the best way for us to make a difference for you in this community? So, Lord, we need help in all these things, and so we run to you and leave ourselves in your hands, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to number 157, the love of God. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4 is the first place we'll be at today, and we 
like to turn ahead and get prepared. <clears throat> Glad that you are here with us today. <clears throat> right, we're in this section, and we've been in it for a while because Jesus has kind of paused from his normal teaching. He's normally traveling around, he's teaching to, lo- to large crowds, but at this moment in time, he makes a little bit more personal. He turns to the religious leaders, he begins to point out their flaws, and then he turns to his followers, and we're in this section we're calling the great perspective. He's talking to them about how he sees the world, how he sees service, and he's comparing it to how the world views things. He was trying to get them, and he's trying to get us to see the world differently. And then he gets to this, what we are calling a very difficult section, because people don't like talking about it, that God requires something of us. He literally turns to his followers and says, to whom much is given, much is demanded, much is required. So we spent last week talking about what are some of those things that God requires of us. We broke it down into four categories, and last week we talked about two of them. We're being in the business of pleasing him. And the Bible is full of examples of the things that we can do that please him. When we hear the word and we apply it to our lives, that is pleasing to him. When we care for the elderly, when we return love to those that loved us, God the Father looks down and he is pleased with it. Remember when Jesus was first starting his ministry and he was doing what the Father wanted him to do and he was teaching and loving? And remember he gets baptized and the voice comes down from heaven and says, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. There's this idea that the Father's looking down from heaven and we are to do the things that puts a smile on his face. We talked about the fact that another thing that we are required to do is to be a light. To live in such a way that people are drawn to us. Sometimes there's these illustrations in the scripture that we can connect to things that we see in life to help us understand it. Have you ever, maybe June, July, and you have a light outside your house and you're looking at it at night and seeing the million bugs that are just attracted to it? Where to be a light that draws people to God? Let your light so shine before men that they see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So that is what is required of us. And we moved into this next section. This is based on a passage in Ephesians, and we're going to look at it in a few minutes, where it says that God has prepared good works for us to do. He's prepared them in advance. So here's this scripture passage that makes it very clear that you and 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 me We have work that God has designed for us, each one of us, to do. And so last week we looked at this idea, if that's true, then why aren't we doing it? So we spent last Sunday night, and if you didn't hear this message, you need to go back and listen to it, because the church has made an error in this area. See, we're in what... I'm not calling it, but people are calling it the mega church age. You know, it's like there's these giant churches around us. I mean, there's some of them, there's one near us that, that well, before the pandemic, 20,000 people would go there on the weekends. And that's just one. We've got like four or five of them around us. And they've gotten into this pattern that the bigger they get, the more employees that they get. And pretty soon the church begins to do all the work. And then people just come in on Sunday and they put their money in the offering plate and then they just go back home. So we've telegraphed the wrong message. Another mistake that the current church has made is that they, they've made services so much entertainment. They've got light shows and they've got smoke and they've got bands. I was sharing last week that one of the churches in the area here literally has a, um, a job opportunity up online. They're looking for a lighting director. You think that'd be pretty big. But it says right in there, no, 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 the lighting director reports to the technical director. Who does the technical director report to? So we put on these shows 
And people end up going to church just to be entertained. And then, of course, there are pastors out there that are teaching falsehood. Joel Osteen is well known for his first book, Your Best Life Now. And so people come to church and they're wanting to know, how can I get my best life now? And all of those things have combined together and caused modern day believers to kind of be in a fog. They don't realize that there is work that they are supposed to do. And so we go to church on Sunday, we come back and we are unaware of the fact that there are things we are supposed to be doing. How do you get rid of the fog? How do you get people to see clearly? Well, the answer is pretty simple. You open up the Bible. You look and see what does the Word of God have to say about this subject. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to lift up this fog of confusion and let people know that, yes, in fact, there is work that they are to do. And I left off with this passage. Let's look at this. This is Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12. In case you think I'm, I'm off on this, in case that you think, well, maybe the church is supposed to be a place of entertainment. Maybe it's supposed to be a place where I just come in and enjoy and the church does all the work. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12, I literally have a job description. It says in there what my job as a pastor is. So let's read it and see if it contains any of that stuff. Let's see if the word entertain is in there anywhere. Let's say, see if anywhere there in there that the pastor does the work. You want to lift the fog, let's just read what the word has to say. Ephesians chapter 4, this is a passage where he's talking about gifts that were given. We're going to get into this in a few minutes. <clears throat> but it says, it was he who gave some to be apostles. There's some who are prophets. There are some to be evangelists. And some to be pastors and teachers. Now these higher offices, these are those that teach the word, and train people, missionaries. So what, what is their job? What is their role? Well, it continues to say what it is to entertain God's people so that they go home happy. Is that what your Bible says? Oh, I, I'm sorry, I read it wrong. Some to be pastors and teachers, to do all the work for God's people so that they don't get stressed. Yours doesn't say that either? Wait, let, oh, I'm sorry, I had some mud on there. To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up so we all reach the unity of the faith. We all come to the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. That's my job. My job is to build you up in your faith, help you get to maturity so you get in the business of doing the works of service he's prepared in advance for you to do. Wow. I said this last Sunday night, and I think this is what's happened. We do not go to church to see what we get. We go to church to learn about what we can give. To whom much is given, much is required. So we laid that groundwork last week so that this week we can start talking a little bit about what it is that we're supposed to do. We'll turn there in just a moment, but let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, <clears throat> It's true that in some ways the church has done a disservice to the believers. We've gotten so busy doing things for you that we've forgotten that we are supposed to do it all together. That you have work for everyone. And so Lord, we just pray that today that the word of God will kind of <clears throat> clear up the fog. Help us to see that you have responsibilities you have tasks that you would like each one of us to do. So help us, Lord, to see that, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're in Ephesians. Now just turn back a couple chapters, and this is kind of our cornerstone passage for this. Ephesians chapter 2. I told you that that whole concept about to whom much is given, much is required, that concept is literally wrapped up completely in this passage we're going to look at. We're going to look at Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. 8 and 9 contain the to whom much is given. 
10, to whom much is given, much is required. All listed for us right in three verses. And you'll see when I read it, and you'll see the much is given part. So here's verse 8. For it is by grace, wonderful grace of Jesus, you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast to whom much is given. We gotta keep reading because verse 10 connects it to the much is required part. What do you mean? You can't read those verses without connecting verse 10 because it says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So there's this idea that God has tasks for each one of us that he wants us to do. People that he wants us to reach. Missionaries that he wants us to to, to support. Church activities that need to be accomplished. And those responsibilities rest on the shoulders of every believer. We talked about this before. The task gets much easier when everybody does their part. But the question that we want to answer today is, how do we know what this work is? How do we figure out what it is? Once again, we're here in Ephesians. Let's go back to chapter 4. We're going to break it down into two areas. There's this idea in the scripture that God looks at believers and the Holy Spirit gives each believer certain gifts. And he does it in a way so that the that the whole church functions in a way that's amazing. Have you ever driven in a car? And perhaps people today don't understand it as much as I did as a kid. But when you're a kid, if you didn't change the points and the plugs in a car on a regular basis, Bagley, what happened? Didn't run very well. And it would kind of buck and chug, and then there's smoke pouring out the back of it. No, what God wants is a finely tuned machine where you turn it on. Oh, and it sounds beautiful because everything's working right. So God looks and gives these gifts to each one of us. And there are a number of passages in the scripture that give us little lists. What are these gifts? What do they look like? Well, here in, in chapter 4 of Ephesians, we get one of the first lists. Verse 7, it says, But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So we're getting this idea that God is choosing to give gifts to certain people. And here's our first list. There's people that are called to be apostles. Uh, Today we might call them missionaries. There are some that are called to be prophets, proclaiming the word. Some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, and some to be teachers. So here is a group that are given certain gifts. But that's not the only place that we see lists. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's go down to verse 4. This whole passage, obviously, you see in verse 1, it says, now about spiritual gifts. He wants to tell us about these gifts. He goes, there are different kinds of gifts given by the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, uh, different kinds of working, but the same God works in all of them. So here it is, verse 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there's given a spirit of wisdom, You'll run into some people, they're just able to open up the word of God and all of a sudden it just makes sense to them. God will often use those kind of people to teach others because the word just kind of explodes to them. To another, the message of knowledge to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. Have you ever been around people that have great faith and they're always thinking big things? you got to have people of faith in the church because they're the ones that are saying, hey, let's just try this big thing. Sometimes it'll drive people crazy. Many years ago, we had two guys on the board that approached the world a little bit differently. And there was, on the corner of Six Mile and Curry, that 
corner piece there, you know, that has that little tower in it for the airplanes, that was for sale. There was 17 acres there. And about that time, you know, when you have a building that was built in the 1800s, as ours is, it takes a little bit of work. So one of the guys on our board was like, let's sell this place and go buy that 17 acres. We can build a new building. It'll all be on one floor. Everything will be new. And he had the, let's just do it. Of course, he almost got lynched by some other guys on the board, but I appreciated his great faith. Doesn't mean things always happen, but people who are given the the gift of faith, dream big, they think big. You got to have them because they're always pushing you because they trust God in, in ways that are amazing. That's a gift that God gives to people. And God wants you, if you have that gift, to be exercising it. Healing, <clears throat> miraculous powers, prophecy, speaking in different kinds of tongues, interpretation, all of those are given in the same spirit. Now here's what verse 11 is important. It says, all these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. So the Holy Spirit looks at you and says, listen, what, what, what gift do you need that will help the body of Christ grow and mature and then make a difference for me out in the world? Let's go to Romans chapter 12. There's another list of these gifts there. <clears throat> this one has what I think is probably the most vital gift in any church. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 4, we get another one of these lists about these gifts. Another reminder that everybody is needed to make the church work. Verse 4, just as each one of us, we are one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So in Christ... We who are many form one body as each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion of his faith. So this not only gives us some gifts, but it says, man, use it. If your gift is serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, teach. If it's encouraging, it's encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, give generously. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Don't you like that list? you got to have people in your church that are filled with mercy because we are a group of misfits. Does anybody agree with that? And we are one messed up ball of people. And when we fail, you got to have the person who is filled with mercy say, listen, we got to love this person. Mercy. Boy, aren't you glad that somebody is given the gift of encouragement? If you're a member of this church, let me tell you something. You get encouraged regularly. People love one another here. And then my favorite in there, because I don't think a church can function without it, the people that gift get the gift of service. Those are the folks that are running around behind the scenes, making sure everything works in the building, making sure it's clean. They're the ones that when an event is over, they're the last one to leave because they want to make sure everything's perfect. They love serving, and they don't need to be patted on the back about it. You can't have a church without people that understand the power of the gift of serving. And so here are these different lists that talk about the importance of each one of us doing our work. Now, how do you know what your gift is? A lot of times churches don't talk about it enough. I put two things up. I'll make sure Howard puts a link on there for you. There's a book that I read years ago. It's called The 19 Gifts of the Spirit. And um, I don't know what happened to it, but we'll get it back. Uh, that book is still available on Amazon. It's available in an e-booklet form if you're the type that likes to read on your Kindle. And it's very easy. He actually goes through these lists that I just pulled up and talked about what do these gifts do and what do they look like in the church. And then the last couple chapters is a little worksheet to kind of help you figure out maybe what is the gift that God has given you. You know another way that you know? You go up to somebody. Hey, what, what gift do you think that I have? I, I can look around this church and I know pretty much what people's gifts are, who are servers, who are encouragers, who have the gifts of mercy. So ask somebody. 
And then when you find out what that gift is, put it into action. We also have some booklets here. We've been using uh, these. There's a pastor down in, in Kentucky, Tennessee, who has since passed away, but he has these booklets that we've been using. His name's Tommy Higgle. And he has a booklet out called, What Are Your Spiritual Gifts? I got a number of those up in the office. If you'd like one of those, you just kind of go through it, fill in the blanks. And at the end, he also has a worksheet to help you find out what are the gifts that God has given you because then you can be in the business of using them. And I want to tell you something, too. When you find out what your gift is and you use it, you are blessed. Obviously, I was given the gift of being a pastor. And I cannot tell you how many times, like this morning, my head is pounding. I was sneezing so much at the house, my wife was like, And the minute I get over here and start opening up the word, I'm blessed. My friends, if you have the gift of serving, when you're serving, you're the kind of guy that's going to be whistling a happy tune. Hey, I get to mop the floor today. Woo-hoo-hoo. If it's encouraging, when you encourage somebody, you come away with a smile on your face. That's the way God designed it. So when he says, I've prepared works in advance for you to do, this isn't something that should be a burden. This is something where you go, I can't wait to find out what my job is, what kind of gift did I get from God. I want to get busy serving him. So the first area is this idea that he gave us gifts. But that's not the only place where God expects us to work. I got one other one for us. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4. The other thing that makes the church special is there's this idea that we are to be in the business, each one of us, of passing on to others the things that we have learned. That's what we do on Wednesday nights when it comes to living proof. We are passing on the things that we have learned about God and giving them to the next generation. And if you're not working here at Living Proof, you can still pass on your faith to the people around you. This idea of passing on the things that are important to us is found in the scripture. And here's one of them. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9. Here Paul says, listen, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Paul understood that there's a one-on-one thing that happens. Sometimes it just happens on a Sunday when you walk through the door of the church and you have a smile on your face. And then maybe you have an opportunity to see somebody else who doesn't have that smile on you. Hey, what's going on? What's wrong? Passing on what you've learned doesn't mean you went to Bible college. It doesn't mean you went to seminary. It means that through your experience with God, you've learned some things. You know what passages to turn to that'll help you have hope. You know the passages that you've read that have encouraged you in a crisis. You hear me often talk about Psalm 103. It's not because I don't know there's other Psalms. It's because Psalm 103 touched me. I love reading about the fact as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on you. So I take the things that mean something to me and I give them to you. And then you do the same thing. You take those verses in Psalm 103 and you give them to somebody else. The way a church grows and becomes stronger and makes an impact for eternity is not based on their advertising budget. It's based on how much they touch the people God sends to them. One other passage that makes this abundantly clear, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Here's kind of the whole discipleship, teaching, training process in one verse. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. So just the things you've learned. You guys know about salvation. You know about hope. You know about that God's our refuge. 
You sang about part of it today. Wonderful grace of Jesus. So the things that you've learned, heard me say, entrust to reliable men who then will be qualified to teach others also. So here we have this picture of one person teaching another. And I just found some of these grandparents reading to their kids, teaching them. I, read, I still read Nancy Drew's stories to my grandkids. Try to get them excited about reading. Parents teaching. How about moms just teaching in the kitchen? You know, at our Living Proof, one of the things that we do each week is we te teach our kids about the value of the kitchen, teaching them how to cook. We look forward to that. It's not just teaching the word. It's teaching life to life. Because your life has been impacted by the word, and you can pass some of those things on to others. And listen to me. When you get this right, you as an individual can make a tremendous impact. Yesterday, every night when I'm up working on my sermons, I open up YouTube and I listen to music in the background. I happen to, currently there's a lady on YouTube called Natalie Rains and she just has a little YouTube channel where she plays piano. I love listening to it. And every Sunday night at 8.30, she has uh, an online program where you can type in a song that you want her to play and then her husband reads it and then she plays it for you. It's wonderful. But now YouTube, they're getting crazy with these ads. So I'm working on my sermon. All of a sudden my music stops. Oh no, another ad. So I go over and you know how it goes. The ad goes for five seconds and you get to hit the skip ad button. It kind of caught my attention. This guy is telling the story of his mission. It's called Charity Water. This young man grew up in a Christian home, hit age 18 and kind of drifted from the things of the Lord and became a, a show promoter for like uh, bars and restaurants. So for eight years, he just lived for himself, drank, smoked, ran around. At the end of eight years, he was in another country, just kind of came to the end of himself and said, I, I just I can't live like this. So he starts looking for an organization that he can just volunteer with. So he finds a boat, one of these giant ships that goes around from country to country. This particular ship went around and stopped in ports, and all they did was treat uh, third world countries, people that had uh, tumors on their faces. And they, they would just cut them off. And so he became their photographer and started documenting it. While he was doing this, he noticed that a lot of these third world countries didn't have fresh water. And a lot of the sickness that was coming is because they're taking water out of the river and there's just there's bugs and insects in them. He says, this is terrible. So he starts a mission called Charity Water. He came back to the States and began to talk to people about this. There's over 100 million people in this world that don't have access to fresh water. So he started this mission. And to date, he's raised millions of dollars and he's put wells in all these third world, world countries and up to this point has now provided fresh water to 11 million people. Wow. Now, it's not a Christian organization, but the reason I bring it up is here's one guy who made a difference that impacted 11 million people because he was passionate about something. My friends, shouldn't we be passionate about Jesus Christ? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And there's this reminder that we don't have to be a college graduate to pass things on. We just have to know a little bit more than the people we're dealing with. And sometimes the little things that we can do will make a difference. The reason that's important is because sometimes on Wednesday nights, we're only with the kids for, for like an hour and a half. And you start to think to yourself, well, I can't do much in that hour and a half. Yes, you can. You can show kids love and teach them one thing that could impact them for years. I thought about this. So <clears throat> the season is drawn to a close. I've had BLT sandwiches almost every day. <laughs> so I was at the little stand on Seven Mile. I don't need tomatoes because my church family has blessed me abundantly. But I needed some corn. And so I was at the little stand. And as I was paying for the cord, right there was a little box of grapes. 
Now, when you go to the store, you buy like the seedless, you get the reds and the purples, but what they had were Concord grapes. They're hard to find. They're the kind that grow on the vines. That's what they make wine out of. And it reminded me of my childhood. I grew up in the city. I didn't have farms like you guys have. I had alleys that I walked down. And in the town that I live in, there was this little unwritten rule in our town that when people planted a garden, if the garden grew into the alley, it was fair game to the kids in the neighborhood. So I'd wander up and down the alleys, waiting for tomatoes to come in bloom. I loved tomatoes back then. I could grab them. And I remember the first time walking down the alley, this guy, this big grape arbor, and these beautiful blue grapes were hanging into the alley. So I grabbed one, and I bit into it. I'm like, oh, who would eat those? So I left them alone. Flash forward a month or two, and one of the older kids in town was cruising the alleys with me. We were alley cruisers. He goes, look, grapes. I go, don't do it, dude. Don't do it. You'll be sorry. He goes, no. So he pulls one off the thing. He goes, trust me on this. He says, put this in your mouth. He says, take your tongue and push it against the roof of your mouth. He goes, the inside pops out. He goes, swallow it. Now, I like this kid some thought. Maybe he's not setting me up. So I pressed it against the roof of my mouth, and I swallowed it. It was so sweet. He says, now chew the outside. Hum. <clears throat> 50 years ago, this guy taught me a simple thing about Concord grapes, and I still enjoy them today. I bought that little basket, and I went out to my trailer, and by the time I got out there, I ate the whole basket, and I had upset tummy. <laughs> One thing that somebody passed on to me 50 years ago still impacts me today. Never forget that something you pass on to these kids could impact them 50, 60 years from now. Be passionate about it and realize that we can make a difference. <clears throat> Let's go back to Ephesians. Something else I want to point out. Why do we have these works? Why do we have to get so busy? My friends, listen, you, I'm not telling you something that you don't know. The task out there is great. So here it talks about how we accomplish this task. This is in the same passage about these gifts that were given. <clears throat> it says here, uh, from him, the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament, the body, the work, the mission. It grows and builds itself self up in love as each part does its work. <clears throat> That's how the church makes a difference. You got the gift of serving, you serve. You got the gift of mercy, you're doing it. You put all these together, and when everybody does it, the ministry prospers. Now, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. You know what that means? I'm preaching to a church family that knows this. That's why we're able to make a difference. But maybe you're watching online, and you have not known that there's work for you to do. Do you see this? It grows and it's held together as each one does its part. If you're out there and you're not doing the job that God has given you, the work is hindered. One last thing that is part of what's required from us. Let's go back to Luke chapter 12. We're going to touch on this briefly because you guys understand this, especially in this day and age that we're living in. As Christ was finishing up this passage, he made it very clear that there are times when we stand for the truth that it might cause a division, even a, divi a division within families. We read this before. He says, I have come to bring fire on the earth. This is Luke chapter 12, verse 49. Excuse me one second. <clears throat> I do that on purpose so Joe will have something to do later and take out my cough. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> Joe has a gift. Uh, but I've, I have a baptism to undergo. Do you think I came to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other. Three against two and two against three. They'll be divided. Father against son, mother, daughter, and on and on the list goes. Christ is trying to remind them that sometimes our stand, our belief in this book causes division. You just got to recognize that. You, you, you hear me keep quoting that verse where Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father 
but by me. That's a divisive verse. That means there are no other paths that lead to God. It's through Christ and Christ alone. So there are, sometimes you have to take a stand for him. And if you haven't noticed lately, there are some battle lines being drawn in our world. You see it everywhere. You can't help but open up your social media posts, and here's what's going on. Well, there are some people that say blue lives matter. There are others that say, nope, it's black lives that matter, and they're in conflict with one another. Now we got the election coming up. There are the Biden folks. There are the Trump folks. Conflict. And now Ruth Bader Ginsburg decided to pass away this last week. And now there's a conflict about that because Trump wants to appoint somebody and the Democrats say, no, it should be the choice of the next administration. And so I'll tell you, the battle lines are being drawn. Are you for abortion? Are you against it? And in the middle of that, you and I must take a stand for the cause of Christ, even though it will cost us. There's a thing in social media, and it's simply called unfriend me. <laughs> And it involves this moment in time where you take a stand, and that stand is the opposite of what some other people, what they believe in. And so they'll post something like this one. It says, I'm going to make it uh, really simple. If you are against gay marriage, please unfriend me. The other guy says, if you are anti-police, I'm blue family, unfriend me. So the battle lines are drawn. You better see things my way or I don't want to be your friend. Doesn't that kind of sound exactly what Christ was talking about here, that there's divisions that will happen? I don't want us to get drawn into all those things, but I do want us to use social media to talk about our faith and what Christ means to us. And listen, when you do that, some of this is going to happen. Because I don't know if you know this or not, but the Bible and the God that we serve is definitely pro-life. And we're going to talk about this in the weeks ahead, about what you have to do when you get into the election booth. And you've got to be pro-life, even though somebody might unfriend you. We must be in the business of taking a stand for him. It'll happen more often when you're doing the work that he gave you to do. So what's today all about? Big responsibility. Hope you know that God has work that you're supposed to do. But I hope I've encouraged you. Something that somebody taught me 50 years ago, I still remember today. What might you be able to teach your kids, your grandkids, the kids that come on Wednesday night that will help them 50 years from now? How about God's wonderful grace? How about the fact that our God is a shelter in a time of storm? Doesn't this younger generation need to know this? The things we do here at church, don't just think it's only an hour and a half. I used to think that. I used to think, Man, it's only an hour and a half, and they have all this other influence all week long. When you think that, you forget about the power of the Word of God and the power that your life has to make a difference in others. So when you start hearing us talking about living proof, it might be Tuesday, it might be Wednesday, I don't know what it is, but you better think to yourself, I want to be a part of that. I want to make a difference in the lives of kids. Remember today, God has work for you to do. God has work for you to do. The only question you have to ask yourself this week is, are you doing it? Father, thank you so much for the word. And even though it's talked a little bit about responsibility and that word makes us uncomfortable, we thank you for the reminder today that we can make a difference and that the body of Christ functions completely when each part does its work. I thank you for this church family because they do their work. But Lord, I know there are folks listening that maybe they've been sitting on the sidelines. Remind them today that you have a work specific for them and that the body of Christ is built up when they do their part. Lord, this is a time for soldiers to rise up. We just pray that we'll do our part. Thank you, Lord, for the word for the privilege of teaching it, for the privilege of hearing it. Thank you for these things today, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we'll be back tonight at 6 o'clock. See you then.